Welcome, Anne. Uh, Anne is a dancer, poet, serial entrepreneur, and well-being deeply curious about how we can upgrade society's concept of wealth and well-being. Among her many projects, Anne is a co-founder uh, of UNIT and a dear uh, friend and co-work. I'm so happy to have you here, Anne. The floor is yours. Thanks so much, Myra. I am just going to select my screen so that we can get this started. Thank you, Myra, for having me and doing an amazing job organizing this. I just have 30 minutes, which is so hard for me to be able to share on something I'm so passionate about. Um, I had a couple of decks that I've presented before, and I, I have to say it has been quite strenuous figuring out exactly what I want to share because there are so many angles to this. Um, but I'd like to start at something I'm seeing emerge in the world right now. And it's almost like a cycle that's repeating in society. Um, and my mom coined it really well. She said, you know, and I think this is the return of the Renaissance. And um, I said, yeah, I, I said, I feel it. And I started to talk to her about the technology aspect. And I think because we are in an era of exponential technology, it has enabled artists really to emerge in multiple forms. So the typical definition of an artist has actually morphed into a hybrid artist. And I will get into talking about that in this, in this session. So what is a 21st century creator? Um, that sounds really heavy and you know it sounds really futuristic. And it really is. I mean, we're, we're an evolving species. And I think when, when we think about artists and we think about you know, creators, we're also thinking about entrepreneurs. And it's funny because in, my, in the last 10 years of actually growing um, my friend circle in artist communities, I've discovered that at least around 80% of artists that I've dealt with are doing multiple things. They're multifaceted. And a lot of them are serial entrepreneurs. They have their hands in multiple buckets. And so, you know, there's a quote that I love and I present it every time I talk about anything to do with entrepreneurship or art. Um, it's by Howard Thurman and he's a civil rights activist, you know, and they, he was born in 1899. So really um, back then, um, you know, he was fighting for this concept of purpose. And that's really what this quote is about. And he said, don't ask yourself what the world needs. Ask yourself what makes you come alive, because what the world needs is more people to come alive. You know, we, we try and solve problems and we try and make ourselves useful, but little do we know that if we can actually find in the depths of ourselves what brings ourselves to life, what we're passionate about, where we want to put our effort and work, we will create great work. So on that note, you know, the next speaker, um, Phil, is a really good friend and he's also a co-founder on the unit team and he's going to touch on creativity and flow. But what really is creativity? You know, people often think of it as, as something that only a few people have. You hear a lot of people who are very left-brained or I would say methodolog methodological. You know, they're always it's stuck in numbers, very good with Excel sheets. They kind of go and come to me and they go, I, I can't draw anything. I was like, well, that doesn't really define creativity. That's not the only definition of creativity, being able to draw or write poetry or be, to be able to dance. Creativity in its definition is actually the use of imagination or original ideas to create something. And the Oxford um, definition of this is, it's also known as inventiveness, right? And so we're now finding ourselves in this global rise of the entrepreneur era. Um, we've heard, and I'm sure many of you know people on the call have heard of what is happening, which is the great re resignation. There are people who are fighting for their freedom, they're leaving jobs, because they do want to do something that they truly feel passionate about. They don't want to be stepped, uh, stepped over by central forces. And that is causing this burst of creativity to emerge where people are trying things and they're not as afraid to fail because they say, what's there to lose? And it's an exciting time. And I really like what uh, Sonia Simon says. She says, just making something, it might be something crummy or awkward or not great for prime time. If you make something, you are creative. And that's really what an entrepreneur is. An artist is, you know, just create. And as you create, you evolve into self-mastery. 
Seth Godin, you know, talks about creativity from the sense of, well, if you're thinking that something may not work, then it could possibly be the best next invention because no one's ever thought of it and you're not too sure how it functions. And so similarly with art, you know, when you're trying to be original, an artist tries to, to define a new technique that is unique to them, whether as a dancer, whether as an, you know, an artist that paints, whether you're in theater plays, whatever it might be, you try and create this um, the sense of uniqueness that you want to show to the world. And the thing I've noticed is that while artists do that, as they actually step into this unknown of this might not work, it's never been done before, they start to create masters in themselves, right? Like no one, no one liked Shakespeare when he was alive. And I mean, there are people who still don't like Shakespeare, right? But, but when you think about the work that he left behind, right? Like he, he's made history. And so it was because he thought, hey, no one's done this before, it may not work, but I'm gonna do it any anyway. And so I really love um, the neuroscientist and um, you know this this man who's in the space of well-being and deep healing, Joe Dispenza, Dr. Joe Dispenza. He says, you know, the brain thinks, but the heart knows. And I think artists are very good at following their heart, and this leads to creativity and inventiveness. But there's also this aspect of fear versus intuition that an artist kind of goes back and forth with. You know, they're putting their work out in the world. They're a little bit not sure if they want to put it out there, and they're thinking, okay okay, should I really do that? Like, is my intuition telling me that I need to push a little harder and just believe in myself a bit and put it out there? Or am I, am I just scared of the repercussions? Am I scared of criticism? And as you navigate between this understanding of yourself, and this is truly important, a great artist or a great entrepreneur, when they really do practice a sense of self-awareness, they start to figure out whether what they're putting out in the world is truly authentic to them and it's coming from a deep sense of intuition or are they creating based out of fear? Are they creating based out of, you know, what does the crowd want versus what is it that's truly authentic to me? And um, I wanna mention Phil again, because he is one of those authentic creators and you're gonna hear him in the next talk. He's true to his art. And I think it's extremely important as an artist to remain true to your art and make sure you don't get swayed by the crowd. You wanna create from a place of knowingness, you wanna create from a place that's unique to you. And that is really true creativity. So the origin of the word creativity is to make or create, and it's dated as back as, you know, the 14th century. I mean, there's cave paintings, and we've been creating art as part of culture ever since we were living in caves. Uh, art actually is what helps transcend what norms are and what society tells us things should be. Art actually goes beyond that and it leaves behind memories of what people want to leave behind for future generations. So when we talk about flow and creativity, there's two types of flow. There's one which is the skilled learn flow, which is, you know, the challenge versus the level of skill you have. So, you know, as an artist, maybe you are a performing artist and you're a dancer and you're learning a certain technique in dance, if you're a ballerina, for example, and you get to a point where you know that you could get better. So you keep pushing yourself. You, you just keep going up the notch and challenging yourself until there comes this point where your muscle memory is, is just switched on and you're so in love with the music, you don't necessarily need to think about what you're doing. You find yourself in this, in this beautiful flow. And what's actually happening in that moment is that you are switching off your prefrontal cortex, which is in front of your brain. You're not thinking about the steps you're taking. Your body is in motion. You're enjoying it. And you have this dump of dopamine and serotonin, which means you're having, you're exper experiencing this bliss or flow. And that's really skilled learned flow where you've practiced enough to get to that place of mastery. And now you're really just enjoying the moment. There's another type of flow, which is intuitive automatic flow. And what that is, is for example, when an, a writer really feels this urge to write, write a novel for the first time, 
you know, they might be drawn to wake up at weird times in the morning, like three, five o'clock, or maybe just be, you know, random times during the day where they feel like they really have this urge to put a pen to paper, or maybe, you know, use a keyboard, whatever it is, whatever floats their boat to get words out of them. And what tends to happen is they're not really thinking about what they're doing. They're just writing because they feel this urge to let out a story, let out a thought, let out this deep intuition or knowingness that's coming from somewhere, right? Creativity flow, but they've never been a practiced author. They've never written a book before. They've not learned how to write. They are just doing it because they feel it. That's another type of flow. And there is the, you know, artists tend to go back and forth between the two. And there are, these are different senses into creativity as an artist. And so, you know, creative flow comes from sometimes like there, there's different ways of looking at it. Sometimes it comes from no logical reason at all. You just feel like you're flowing and you're, you you want to be creative. Or it may come with this burning urge to experience something beyond your current self. Like you want to try something absolutely new and you're pushing yourself to get there. Then you experience this flow because of the challenges and skills that you've acquired through, through the journey. The third is, you know, you want to solve something that matters to you. So you get into the state of flow because you're so passionate about solving that problem. And this is, you know, entrepreneurial artistic mastery. Um, the fourth is you may, you know, attain a sense of relief by transmuting your emotions. So they say some of the great art, greatest art is created by a deep sense of pain or anger or even joy because you have this sense of wanting to create something from an emotion that's deeply rooted in yourself. And the fifth is by sharing your story through what you create. You, you have a story that you want to put out in the world and whatever your art form you get it out there through this sense of flow into creativity. So no matter what your age or your life path, whether making art is your career or your hobby or your dream, it is not too late or too egotistical or too selfish or too silly to work on your creativity, right? You push the bar. And there's a great book by um, Julian Cameron. And this, this book was given to me when I actually went on my journey to discover what I wanted to do from an artistic point of view. Um, and it's called The Artist's Way. I highly recommend it. So what is a common trait of the creative process? It's really deep curiosity. So what is an artist? An artist is a person engaged in an activity related to creating art, right? Practicing art, demonstrating art. Um, what is a hybrid artist? Hybrid artists are really the new era of artists. They are multifaceted, they play in multiple domains, and they usually live on the intersection of art and technology. And so this woman over here, she's truly fascinating. Her name is Merit, Dr. Merritt Moore. You can find her on LinkedIn, follow her work. She's in, you know, nominated Forbes 30 under 30. She's a quantum physicist and a professional ball ballerina, right? And she's not afraid to say that on LinkedIn. And when I think about these things, I think, well, this is the new emergence of what it means to actually create a bridge between art and technology. And so what she's doing, she's deep in the space of physics. And she said something really, really, really interesting and profound to think about. She said only 3% of Nobel Science laureates have worn a dress to Stockholm, right? Even today, barely one in five physics postgraduates is female. And when, when, I, when I read that, I thought it was so profound from, from the aspect of us having been very um, embedded in what I, I call the productivity economy. And the sense of competition, the sense of reaching the top, the sense of the corporate ladder, the sense of proving oneself. I think when women entered the workforce, they felt this need to be more like men. And it's a real pity when you think of the yin and yang, you know, we, we actually can complement each other quite beautifully. And if women just brought their natural women traits, of deep empathy, of compassion, of collaboration, of being able to bring artistic vision just by being present to a group of people. Well, wouldn't that be beautiful rather than just thinking about efficiency and just thinking about you know, productivity and how we're going to hit certain targets? And I think this is, this is what's changing in 
the entrepreneurial space. And this is what's changing in, in corporations around the world, trying to introduce more women into the workplace because they're starting to see that there needs to be this collaboration between that yin and yang. And so she is someone who deeply inspires me. And I'm just gonna share a little bit of her story. Um, this artist is one in many that I wanted to present. I've got a portfolio of artists who I follow who are at this intersection of art and technology. But I would love you to listen in on a day in her life because it really speaks to what it means to, um, to, to start becoming, if that's what you feel deep inside you, a hybrid artist. A lot of times people feel like they can't do two things or three things, that it's too much. But actually, if you're super passionate, you can bridge these spaces together. So this video is slightly minutes, and I'd love to share it with you because I think it really um, encompasses a hybrid artist's life. <laughs> So my name is Merritt Moore, and I'm off to the physics department. Uh, this is my daily trek along. So here we go, I'm at the building. Physics building. My fancy job title is ballerina quantum physicist, but in reality, I'm a stressed out, sleep deprived graduate student. I first went into a dance class when I was 13, and it was like I was forced to go in to the dance class because my mom said that I had terrible posture. And I was walking around like my grandfather and I had to take a ballet class. And I was like, no, I don't want to be in pink dance. Like, this is awful. But then I, I totally fell in love with it because um, I think also as a kid, I, I didn't really speak much. I didn't speak till I was three. And even then I was very, um, I used, I think my body language rather than words specifically. And so when I fell into the dance class, I was like, oh my gosh, this feels so incredibly natural. I've been doing this now 16 years as the dancing physics, and I've been very separate. We're to the point where I've like hidden, that I've danced from the physics world and hidden that I really do physics from the dance world. And so now you know, I'm finally able to do projects that combine the two, whether it be like virtual reality projects um, or next month working with like uh, choreographing a dance with robots at the DNA. Like those kind of things get me so excited because finally I can merge the two worlds together. Typical day, I wish I had a typical day because it'd make my life so much easier. Um, it really depends on Oh, what's most pressing. So experiments take priority. So welcome to my lab. We have this apparatus that we have the photons coming from upstairs. And it goes all the way down, 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 down to this tiny little chip all the way at the bottom to detect the single photon. <laughs> running late for the bus, as I'm, because I'm always running late. Um, going to the physics lab today. And with my experiment, I have to, um, very technical components that unfortunately don't like to work at the same time <laughs> so if they are working at the same time that means i just cut out everything and that's all i work on so i've i've spent three weeks in the lab probably 21 hours a day changing this knob like every 20 minutes and, and literally like sleeping up at the lab um just to get the experiment done when that's not when I can ease off from that a little bit, which is nice. Then if I have a performance, that would be the next one priority. And so I'll do extra training, which means I'll wake up early, really early. I'll start stretching when I'm brushing my teeth. I'll start like doing my feet exercises on the way to the gym. And then at the gym, I'll do two hours before I come to the lab, work at the lab, go for a run during lunch, come back to the lab. You know, every hour I'll go to the stairways and do a stretch or like a little bar. And then at the end of the day, I'll do another class. And so that kind of sums it up, you know, how do you create a life where you, where you want to do two very, very different things? 
um, at work. And I think, you know, she's done a fantastic job. So I just want to show very briefly for the purpose of time, you know, what one of her performances looks like, where she actually dances with a robot called Barry Sh Shinnott. And she actually programmed this so that they could do a duet together. And if you think about what is possible from an experiment like this, you know, it, it's, it's artistic, yes, but when you think of exoskeletons and how robotics can play into understanding human, the human body and movement, you know, she's looking at different aspects of what her programming and her understanding of quantum physics and the human body can do for betterment of society. So I'm gonna just play this really briefly, not the whole thing. you watching some of her work but what she's trying to do is really use her knowledge of the human body to then you know look at what could pot potentially even be the intersection of art tech and healthcare right when you're thinking about exoskeletons and helping people um, use technology to gain mobility and so you know when I think about how that works I think well you know what her, what is what has her story done in regard to impacting the sustainable development goals? Like what what are the things that she's working on that are actually impacting multiple of these? And to me, it's quite profound because you know it touches on good health and well being, which is everything to do with movement and understanding the body and the physics behind the body. And if you look into her work, it's pretty profound in that arena. You know, education in this space of how you can merge. Uh, two very different careers and create a new one. Um, gender equality, which talks about, you know, women and can be really women in the workplace or whatever it is you're building. Um, decent work and economic growth. And she, she actually touches on in her work how, you know, she could make a profession out of being an artist, but she could also tie it very nicely in with quantum physics. Um, and, you know, there are others too, reduced inequalities and um, industry innovation and infrastructure, right? So everything to do with robotics and then also being able to champion the dance industry. So there were quite a few different examples in my deck and I cannot get into all of them. But what I do want to touch on is I want to share a little bit about what is happening right now with the return of the Renaissance. I'll, I'll spend at least two minutes on this. So we're in this phase where artists are starting to realize thanks to technology and thanks to these kind of decentralized structures, you know, with the emergence of cryptocurrencies, um, that they can actually have the sense of artful abundance where they don't need to negotiate contracts for their art, that things can you know, be coded into smart contracts through, you know, NFTs, for example. I mean, this new hype is around NFTs, and I think we have a couple of speakers who are going to touch on this more. But NFTs can give artists a clean way to generate wealth. And, you know, I just want to show a couple of examples. Um, Beeple, who is, you know, quite a popular NFT artist, like he put... 5,000 days of work, of his work. So he'd create a piece of art every day. And he kind of just created this massive collage over 5,000 days of his work. And that sold for 69 million uh, as an NFT, right? Um, another piece of his work sold for, for 6 million. Um, and then there are other reasons people create NFTs, right? So like Edward Snowden, if you follow his work, right? Um, he's actually put out the papers that he released back you know, back in the day where there was a big controversy and obviously he was he was kicked out of the United States. Well, he's kind of sold this stay free piece of art 
for $5.4 million, and he's fed it back into a foundation, which is the Freedom of Press Foundation, to make sure people always have this uh, freedom for, for public speech. Uh, another one is save a thousand lives. So, you know, for, for charity work, um, they, the, this one organization raised $5.23 million in this NFT sale. And then they put it back into everything that was going in uh, for, for COVID um, cases around the world. Um, so it's very interesting, the different kind of use cases that have come out of NFTs. But here's a question, what's next, right? Um, you think about NFTs um, as a collectible, which is really what it is. An NFT is a non-fungible token. It's a collectible item. It has a unique zero code and it is unique to that one artist. And what an NFT enables an artist to do is to have a smart contract that says, hey, you know, you're going to get X amount in terms of royalty fee. You can code it in any way uh, you want. If you sell this and it moves from one person to another, you would be able to track you know, where that piece of art is going and always be able to, by default, through the system, earn a certain amount of royalties around it. But what we're starting to see with this emergence of hybrid artists is the startup hybrid artist, which is, well, could this concept of an entrepreneur, right, not just be um, taken from the perspective of building, uh, you know, a minimal viable product in the business world and taking it out to market for whatever reason, for a social good project, or, you know, maybe it's a pivoted idea in an organization and you're starting up something new. It could also be relatable to artists who are creating at the intersection of art and technology. And it could also be relatable if they're creating in the space of impact for good projects that are related to SDGs. Also, how could that look like if, if, a, if an artist can be viewed as an individual, as a startup in it of themselves? That would be a pretty cool concept because now you're not necessarily buying into just a product or service that they have. You're buying into what they stand for, the work that they're doing, and really what we hope they would create over a lifetime. So could this potentially start to create a more inclusive culture for artists? You know, art, the, the, the starving artist syndrome has been something that has been talked about forever, ever since you know, people started to really get out and want to pursue careers in art. It's always been difficult. Like it's been, the, the story of making it as an artist has always been a difficult one. And what we're saying, well, you know, maybe in this world of, of crypto and decentralized economies, maybe we can create a more inclusive space for artists. And so what I'd like to ask is, you know, can we make a sustainable livelihood from what makes us come alive? I think this is the question that, that every artist who's starting off kind of asks, you know, do I really wanna do this full time? Because it, I'm kind of scared that I'm gonna be able to make it. And we say, well, now with the way technology is and NFT is actually giving rise to this, um, you know, this era of, well, maybe we can create, generate wealth and we can actually keep track of it in a way that you know, benefits us but what could we do so that we create more sustainable generational wealth? So I believe that one of the playgrounds to experiment for artists is really token economies. And token economies can actually give artists this clean way to create really what would be a business around all the work that they do. Um, Michael Haley, who's actually the CTO of UNIT, you know, he, he coined this, um, this phrase, which I really love. And he says, the future of community is cooperative ownership. So could we, if, you know, if I, if I love the work Marina does, if I love the work Mayra does, if I love the work Eric does, or, you know, Praveen, could I just invest in them and, and say, hey, I support you. Um, I want to be a part of your community and I want to see you thrive. So could potentially almost like you have a crowdfunding initiative, you're now investing in people you love and care about. And through that, we could actually support each other and be able to create more of a collaborative ecosystem of, of artists who can do multiple things, but you're not buying into their product and service. What you're doing is you're buying into their brand. Um, and so I think we've only got two minutes left and, um, you know, there's, there's a ton that I'd love to share, but I think I'll stop at that on that note. Um, the concept of token economy is really allows 
it can really allow an artist to, to play around with what it means to build out a community, just like any business would build out a business. Um, since I've got a minute, I'm just gonna share this one slide, which I think will help you really understand how that could work. So when, when, I, when I look at Facebook and Facebook having bought out WhatsApp, you know, they, they bought it. It was one of the most you know, the largest private acquisitions of a VC back company, right? Like they, they spent 22 billion to buy WhatsApp. And it was a really big win for the investment company, Sequera, who actually made, like they made 3 billion, right? Like out of it. Um, and they only put a 60 million investment into WhatsApp. They didn't know it was gonna get that big. And now WhatsApp has over 2 billion users. Well, when I think about that, I think, well, could a hybrid artist like my Merit kickstart a fund where she says, hey, I'm doing all these things, kind of like what's up. You know, she imagined Merit as what's up. And, and suddenly she starts growing, but now she's growing in a way where everyone who's invested in her, you know, these 2 billion users on what's up, imagine those 2 billion users or ecosystem members supporting Merit. Well, now she's actually growing an economy of her own. And I, if I wanted to fund Merit or put in, you know, get some tokens of her entire pool of tokens, I now would be able to own into Merit's work. And I think that's really profound. Um, I'd love to share more. I'm at the half an hour mark. Anyone who wants to talk more about token economies and artists, feel free to reach out to me on LinkedIn. Um, it's been super awesome sharing. And uh, yeah, I think Phil is going to be coming on next. So Mayra, thank you for having me. Oh, thank you for having us. <laughs> You're brilliant. Thank you so much. By showing up hands, who was thinking about token economy in this light that Anne just showed it to us? Mm -hmm.